you all recall in our area in 2019, we were slammed with Hurricane Michael. And it was at that time, you know, of course we knew in, in the most um, kind of general and specific terms that human traffickers take advantage of, of crises, whether that's a natural disaster or a pandemic, they will take advantage, they're nimble, they will look to, um, to those who are, to, to really, they're recruiting those who are made vulnerable by any of these things. So with that, I did some research and actually started to promote and advocate in our local governments that they look at the city of Houston because y'all were doing such great stuff, Minal. And, and, you know, I downloaded the toolkits and looked at it. And so it's kind of like a little, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm both a fangirl, but, I, but I'm also a policy wonk and appreciate deeply the work that you all have done. So let me introduce you all to Minal Patel Davis now. Um, she is the director of the Mayor's Office of Human Trafficking and Domestic Violence. She um, she chairs the Houston 2026 Men's FIFA World Cup Bid Committee. So you've got quite a um, quite a diverse um, skill set, and was previously advisor to the mayor on human trafficking. Um, this is the first municipal level position of its kind in the U.S. And wow, do I wish that every city in Florida could have that position. Um, uh, she was cha charged with making a local impact on human trafficking in the fourth largest city um, on a policy level perspective and by advancing systems change. She's developed and implemented Mayor Turner's anti-human trafficking strategic plan, um, which is dubbed the first comprehensive municipal re response to human trafficking by a U.S. city. Um, Minal is passionate about helping other cities design and design the 1010 Human Trafficking Response Municipal Fellowship, a two-day immersion program for mayor's offices around the U.S. and abroad. This replicates, uh, it's a replicated model that spans across city departments that range from airports, health, police, procurement, and neighborhoods. Um, and I have to tell you, just on a personal note, I can... You can tell, and you will tell when you when you hear from her about how she has learned on the ground. This is not abstract knowledge, um, um, ivory tower knowledge. This is on the ground knowledge that that all those you know how important all those departments and and places are. Um, as chair of the bid committee's human rights subcommittee, she engaged over a hundred stakeholders and less than four months across eight topics during the bid process to craft human rights responses and help secure host city designation. She's a past speaker at the United Nations World Humanitarian Summit, an organization for security and cooperation in Europe. Her work has been covered in the Washington Post, New York Times, and other national and international outlets. And she is the recipient of the prestigious Presidential Award for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons. Um, Ms. Davis has her JD and MBA from the University of Connecticut, sorry, Connecticut, and a BA from New York University. So with that, um, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. I know your calendar is packed and I thank you and welcome you um, to our program. Thank you so much for that, Robin. I'm just gonna get my presentation up. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Let me just try to get this started from the beginning. Okay, let's try that. Can you see that? Yes, but we have your other slides to the right. So um, you might want to go back to that slideshow. Okay. Let's it might that. be better than if you all try to share it then. Okay. Let me stop the share and we can get started and I'll just say next slide. Okay, that sounds good. I will pull it up. So while um, Robin pulls it up, I will just go ahead and get us started. So I want to thank everybody for joining today. I'm very glad to be here. When we talk about Hurricane Harvey and we do a deep dive into one of our many initiatives, one of the things I like to do is make sure that the audience has an overview or an understanding of the city of Houston's anti-trafficking strategic plan. I can take the next slide, Robin. And so we developed our anti-trafficking strategic plan 
Well, after talking to 250 local and national stakeholders when I started in this office about seven years ago. And the reason we did this massive stakeholder engagement and landscape assessment is because I was the first person in the US to hold an office or a position like this. So we really wanted to be intentional about carving out our space and leveraging all of the opportunity that existed within municipal government to address trafficking. And that looked very different than what the response was seven years ago. And so here's an overview of the city's plan. I'll take just a few minutes to do this and we'll dedicate the rest of the time to our Hurricane Harvey response. So the first objective that we knew that we had a strength in and that there was a gap was institutionalizing the city of Houston's response and implementing trainings at scale for city departments. So what this looks like for us is analyzing and passing ordinances. We're the first major U.S. city to have an anti-trafficking hotel ordinance that regulates the 550 plus hotels in the city of Houston, for instance. And when I talk about our work with all of the city departments that roll up to the mayor's office, we're intentional about, intentional about making sure many of our city departments have an anti-trafficking function embedded into their day-to-day. -day. So our health department, for instance, screens and refers victims for trafficking. Our procurement department, the largest thing we procure with our $5 billion budget is labor. So we have a zero tolerance for trafficking in all of the city's contracts. Our second objective is to raise awareness and change public perception. So to this end, we developed and we launched our Watch for Traffic media campaign that generated 93 million impressions in a city of 2 million people. That's a good outcome. And we increased calls to the tip hotline by 80% during the eight months that we ran this campaign and cases confirmed by 49%. We also host mayor's office events around intersections with trafficking to ensure we're raising the level of dialogue here in Houston, not just amongst community members, nonprofits, law enforcement, but of course, corporate citizens as well. The third thing we work to do is coordinate victim services and engage in outreach. And what we've done is make sure we create an alternate pathway to safety from law, enforce, law enforcement investigations for those victims that may not want to engage law enforcement. So we've set up a system of screenings in the healthcare industry in with our direct outreach agencies to ensure that we're finding victims without the aid of law enforcement. And then we've built out a shelter collaborative where we work with the shelter and we have beds on reserve with them and our outreach agencies can place people that they encounter in crisis there where they get access to housing. And then we also have established dedicated professionals that offer psychological and medical case management services to victims of trafficking through our services collaborative. Our fourth objective is essentially our local stakeholder group, which is the mayor's policy council. They really help undergird our whole plan and our fifth objective, because we were the first, we felt we had this awesome responsibility to make sure we documented everything we did, collected the data around it, and were able to tell a persuasive story so that other cities would start to adopt the kinds of things we were doing in the city of Houston. This initial phase of our plan was issued in 2016. I was appointed in 2015, and we finished it very quickly and released phase two of our plan in August 2018, which includes our hurricane. Harvey response, right? That was something we hadn't planned for. So next slide, and we'll go ahead and get started with the Hurricane Harvey contact. And you know, as you're doing that too, I have a special request for you, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, um, sure. shame on me, is that we have communities in Southwest Florida, in the Orlando area, in the Jacksonville, you know, all throughout Florida, essentially who are now in the process of recovering from the devastations mm -hmm. of Hurricane Ian. So mm -hmm. as you're going, um, in particular, I just wanted to acknowledge everybody who's attending now, who is in the throes of, of that um, hurricane recovery, know that you've got lots of folks in Florida, I think who are on today, who are really in the middle of everything. So, um, so any special tips you can offer there, that will be great. Yeah, it was um, extremely traumatic. So I really do feel with everyone that's suffering from the aftermath of what's happened there. And um, we can skip this slide. I'll go to the next slide. 
Okay, so Hurricane Harvey, when we talk about what happened, it was a very costly tragedy, and it looks like many of you are living through this right now. But Texas Governor Greg Abbott estimated the damage from Harvey to be up to $180 billion and called it more costly than epic hurricanes Katrina or Sandy, which devastated New Orleans in 2005 and then New York City in 2012. Next slide. So post-disaster human trafficking risks. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina displaced hundreds of thousands of people in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, and it caused more than 100 billion in damages, and it triggered this massive redevelopment effort to rebuild homes, infrastructure, and whole industries. So many cities, including New Orleans, they faced a worker shortage to build the reconstruction and recovery-related jobs at the time. Some of those companies used force, fraud, or deception or coercion to fill the vacancies with coerced and trafficked labor. At the same time, you had the United States DHS lift certain labor regulations for a period of time to help expedite recovery. So given the economic opportunity you had at the time, the scarcity of workers at the time, and the need to quickly begin reconstruction, Katrina exposed various risks to businesses utilizing contractors and recruiters to fulfill their labor needs. Katrina also exposed legal and ethical risks to businesses involved in reconstruction efforts and human rights risks to the workers that they employ. Next slide. So for our short and long-term disaster response, one thing we knew we had to do because the community wasn't aware is make them aware that displaced persons may be more vulnerable to predators like traffickers. The mayor's office developed a prevent preventative short and long-term set of responses. We use the International Office of Migration recommendations as the initial guide to what we do. In the short term, we assessed the shelter landscape. I don't know if you remember, Harvey, it was a while ago now, but we essentially had 14,000 people overnight at our convention center here in our downtown uh, area, of, in the downtown area of our city. So we assessed the shelter landscape, which means we essentially did a walkthrough to develop outreach and communication strategies that may not be possible in another shelter, or may, they may be different in another shelter, but we had to figure out which and where are the communication touch points for the people in the shelter. And we educated residents at the shelter on the nexus between natural disasters and human trafficking through daily information in newsletters and through all of the hallway monitors at GRB. Our anti-trafficking team of staff and volunteers, we also decided that that wasn't enough. And we actually went cot to cot at the shelters to place notes in English and Spanish and warn residents about recruitment tactics by traffickers in the shelter setting and or online, both on the sex trafficking and the labor trafficking side. So some of the information, we warned them about false job offers that may lead to trafficking. And we let all of the displaced people know that there is help available if they in fact find them themselves in these situations. Next slide. So this is an excerpt from our newsletter. I'll read it very quickly. Of course, space was limited. Um, it says human trafficking, displaced people may become more vulnerable to trafficking, both labor trafficking and or sex trafficking. Traffickers can use a person's vulnerabilities by meeting their basic needs, luring them into a relationship, and then forcing them into selling sex. If you're looking for work, make sure you only accept jobs from people you trust and make sure you're paid and are in control of your identification. And then we have the national trafficking tip hotline. Next slide. This is an image of our shelter monitor slide with similar uh, verbiage, so I won't read it. We did note on the shelter monitor slide, we had a little more room about trafficking being different than smuggling. That's still something that people confuse quite a bit here. Next slide. This is our COT note, the disaster response COT note that we were placing in COTS while we were talking to people. Now, it didn't look like this during the hurricane. This is the nice polished version that we produced many weeks after the hurricane. We had it translated into French, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Tagalog, and Thai. We had another set of cards that was translated into Spanish, Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, and Hindi. Next slide. 
this is what our cotton notes actually looked like. It was on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. The top part was English, the bottom part was Spanish, and we had it cut in half. And this is what we were taking um, cot to cot, literally. And it had the same in the nicer version, the same language, so I won't read it. Um, but this is actually what we were using during the time. Next slide, and that should be the Spanish version of the cot note. Can I can I stop for a minute and and just observe something about this that is so great? Um, notice the quotes, everybody in the middle. You know, giving those real life examples about how the come on might happen is so it, it's so important. That was such a great idea, you know. Um, we had survivors help us. Uh, Rebecca Bender, you may be familiar with her. She actually was on the phone with us in Portland from the command center helping us to write this along with someone who led a child sex trafficking shelter here called Freedom Place. So I had a lot of help even during the hurricane. And I remember at the time, Rebecca was actually dealing with forest fires in Portland and was literally at a Costco or Target trying to get everything so that she could be ready for um, the fires. So it was hectic all around. Um, but next slide, please. So this is the Spanish cot note. This is an interesting sort of story. We literally translated this in the hallways of our convention center with a Spanish speaking worker from Mexico that was there with the Salvation Army or the Red Cross. And usually we have this very intense translation vetting process here at the city. Um, and all of those rules were sort of out the window. Next slide. So for in the long term, we did a lot of different things as well. We redesigned our Watch for Traffic media campaign to indicate the nexus between natural disasters and the rise in trafficking. The costs for this were actually reimbursed by the Federal Office of Trafficking in Persons. We also finalized our executive order to ensure that the city engages in safe labor contracting practices. You know, we wanted to mitigate the risk that comes from the rebuilding efforts, especially that now that you have a global movement of laborers coming in for the the rebuild. The Department of State, our regional office here, was also on alert about visa fraud and potential investigations related to Harvey. We proactively sent a list of all of the city's contractors and subcontractors to our regional DOS office, and we cre also created a forum for H2B visa applicants with relevant consular offices so they can share information with their citizens. We received a significant grant from a private law firm, it's Jones Day, it's an international law firm, to boost the capacity of partner organizations engaged in direct outreach with vulnerable populations. And we, after the hurricane, we translated that cot note into those multiple languages I showed you previously, which was also reimbursed by the federal OTIP office. Next slide. Here's an image of the Watch for Traffic media campaign for Hurricane Harvey. It says, as the water recedes, labor trafficking may rise, and then the same for sex trafficking. This was changed. That was the original imagery we used for a massive campaign that we had run a couple of years prior to Harvey. Next slide. So this is the placement for our billboards that I just showed you across the city of Houston there. The double yellow lines is inside the loop, outside the loop, and then the greater metro area. And you could see that we tracked where we placed it in English and Spanish because we're constantly collecting data, impressions, and things like that. Next slide. So the executive order, I'll talk a little bit more about this. I've mentioned it twice already. So the executive order for labor trafficking and all of the city's purchasing decisions, it makes counter trafficking a priority issue. Uh, we lead by example by ensuring that the city doesn't do business with dubious contractors, and we use it to help raise awareness of trafficking and boost corporate action. We are home to more than 50 Fortune 500 companies in the city of Houston. They're headquartered here. So we were messaging with them for about a year after Hurricane Harvey. It also encourages our contractors to proactively follow ethical employee labor and recruitment practices. It declares the city is going to use its purchasing power to conduct business with enterprises that are taking positive steps to root out trafficking from their supply chains. And it's a part of every city contract after November 2017. One example is that it's even been a part of a $250 million municipal bond deal for an airport expansion here. And that means it's reaching a different set of vendors like Morgan Stanley, Bankers Trust, 
um, than we would otherwise reach through our traditional efforts um, as the anti-trafficking community. The EO does allow for waivers in case companies literally have no idea what we're talking about and don't understand how to comply. It's obviously not a waiver to exploit people during the course of your um, services being rendered to the city. We unintentionally gained national and international attention for this executive order. It was covered in Bloomberg Law's white collar crime report that stated Houston was on the compliance vanguard. I know I saw at least one person from Houston join, but if you know anything about Houston, we're a very anti-regulatory city. So to be called, um, saying that to be to, for it to be stated that Houston was on the compliance vanguard uh, was very interesting, but these were regulatory steps that we were taking, so it made a lot of sense. We also encourage corporations to follow our example and take steps to address their own supply chains and impact labor trafficking in their sphere of influence. Next slide. That's just an image from the Bloomberg Law article. We didn't know they were writing it. It came out around Christmas. You know, you're always holding your breath as you turn the pages and we were very pleased with the coverage. So it ended up being like a, or a Christmas gift. Um, we were very concerned as we were reading it and didn't know about it. So next slide. A little bit more about our long-term uh, response to Harvey. We provided outreach um, organizations with the vulnerability map that highlights priority outreach areas based on a cross of structural damage from Harvey with four demographic maps that indicate at-risk indicators. So those four indicators were no high school diploma, median income, female-led households, and unemployment. And once we mapped all of this, we also provided lists of schools, churches, and apartment complexes within each of the target areas. We also coordinated a Harvey social media campaign to raise awareness of post-disaster vulnerabilities, another resource for outreach groups and to complement their efforts. And the reason we did this is when I went cot to cot, I had a young male tell me that he was already starting to see ads in his Facebook feed about job opportunities. Uh, right there, I think. Nope, go back. Yeah, right here. Um, and so that's where we started our social media campaign. So we're developed, we we're also developed a long term effort to educate corporate communities or businesses on the signal case and encourage oversight for their contractors. So the signal case involved 500 Indian guest workers who were trafficked for their labor after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. And so we took all of that information to help formulate everything we were going to do. And after a year of presenting to the corporate community, we held an October 2018 event, a mayor's office event, to engage the local national corporate community by framing trafficking as a risk mitigation compliance issue and encouraging them again to focus on their supply chains. Next slide. Here's the mapping exercise that we did. So those are the four indicators, the high school diploma, female-led households, unemployment rate, median household income with the structural damage map from Harvey. Next slide. And it produced this map that essentially highlighted 31 highly vulnerable areas in our city, which we then gave to all of the faith-based outreach organizations that really wanted to do something and they coordinated amongst themselves to get the best coverage. Next slide. Here's our Harvey social media campaign. Like I said, it complemented uh, outreach organizations efforts. We had four posts that we paid for on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It highlighted the post-disaster vulnerabilities and how traffickers may prey on individuals. We provided contact info of local organizations serving both sex and labor trafficking victims. And partners were provided with the campaign materials beforehand, and we coordinated our post dates with them. It ran for a month, one time a week, and the campaign, the partner guide, the messaging documents, and the posts, and everything else I've discussed are available on our emergency disaster toolkit. We did this with the nonprofit Love 146, a child sex trafficking organization headquartered out of Connecticut. Next slide. So summary of our corporate risk mitigation presentations. We engage the corporate community, like I've said. Obviously, it's important to engage them even if there's no post-disaster context. But remember, the corporate community has assets that have been damaged as well. And so they're going to have people that are going to come to rebuild those as well. So the presentation for the corporate community, the corporate risk mitigation presentations, outlines post-disaster risks, push and pull factors. Uh, not only do we discuss the signal case, but we talk about four total case studies 
from Katrina and Louisiana that impacted the construction, oil and gas, the hospitality and the education sectors. And they really go through a continuum of exploitation from labor exploitation all the way to trafficking. It also advances intervention and prevention recommendations. And again, it frames trafficking in a language that's relevant to businesses. A lot of times when nonprofits go to businesses, it's to fundraise for their own nonprofit and that's great they'll tell a victim narrative, we need that, but it also misses that larger opportunity for dialogue for them to impact what may be a global supply chain. So we've presented for oil and gas, corporate social responsibility roundtables, banking and compliance specialists, insurance companies, all for that year following Carvey. Uh, the full presentation is about 40 minutes and that's some snapshots from that one. Um, next slide. So the mayor's office event, remember we did these corporate risk presentations for about a year and they'll be culminated with a big mayor's office event at one of our city theaters. So in 2018, we engaged corporate leaders on trafficking as the mitigation compliance issue. And again, we wanted to make sure that businesses understood that it impacted their bottom lines because one of those Katrina case studies had a business go bankrupt because of the liabilities. Um, we also discussed corporate response strategies from ch supply chain management to responsible sourcing and ethical recruitment. And we had speakers that were experts from the Department of State, Verite, a social auditing firm, a capacity building NGO called the Freedom Fund, the hotel industry at the time, somebody from Marriott International, and a funder who's helped us with a lot of our work here, but also funded trafficking initiatives across the globe. Next slide. So grant funds to increase outreach capacity, that private law firm Jones Day also gave us a substantial grant during Hurricane Harvey that we then immediately re-granted to increase post-disaster outreach and corporate and paid for that corporate and consular education mayor's office event. So we gave grant funds to six Houston nonprofits. The largest went to our worker center, Bay e Justicia, to screen their labor violation calls, also for trafficking, not just labor violations, and to increase their outreach efforts and awareness efforts. So the funds to increase outreach in high prostitution areas were also granted, and additional grants increased outreach to those in the online sex ads and those that were working to decrease demand. So one thing I wanted to share with you here is there's a lot of different rhetoric out there, but here's what we saw as far as back page ads right after Hurricane Harvey. So the red lines are the days of and immediately after Hurricane Harvey, and you see a massive dip below what we were averaging over the last few months. Now, right after Hurricane Harvey and everything sort of settles down after that, the damage has been done, but the rain has stopped, people are going back to somewhat of a normal life, even if they're rebuilding, we saw that the ads would jumped way over our typical average number of ads. But one thing that I think that we as a community don't do well and could do better is it also started to drop off. If you look at that last bar, it shows that it went down well below our national average. So just when we're talking about trafficking um, and what's actually happening, it's always better to be telling the most accurate picture and stories. So next slide. So we distilled our response, all of the legal research I've talked to you about into a protocol book, Jones Day and their attorneys helped us do that. And it has everything, way more detail about our short and our long-term responses. It also has the recommendations we make based on our experience on the ground here. It has an appendices of everything we did around our short and long-term disaster response. And it also has those four detailed case studies. Next slide. So lessons learned, we learned so much um, and we wanted to make sure we documented this. You know, of course, prepare your outreach materials prior to the disaster. We had no idea that Harvey was gonna dump 51 inches of rain on a very flat, low-lying city in two days. Um, our, of course, disasters result in power outages, but for the first time, City Hall had no power. Streets around it were flooded, we couldn't access it. And so I had to work really hard and creatively in the command center at the convention center to get things done. Obviously it's easier here. Uh, we were literally sharing like one copier uh, amongst all of us there. So making sure you have the materials downloaded from our website and adapted for your use locally, um, storing them in multiple areas is key. Uh, so that is probably the number one tip. That's why it's right there up on top. Like I said, it left City Hall inaccessible and we had limited 
uh, access not only to tech and printers, but even a pair of scissors were hard to find at the command center. Uh, the materials are critical for preventative education and outreach to evacuees. We're very proud to say that I think we're about five years out from Hurricane Harvey, and we, we do not have records of a single labor protest or anything arising from that, indicating to us that our preventative work was so far effective. Um, we prepare, you know, prepare in advance and maintain in paper and electronic form. Note that translation standards may not be upheld, and that's okay. None of these things should actually keep you from doing the preventative work. We also know we need to institutionalize this response into our Houston Health Department um, response or our Office of Emergency Management response. The other thing is coordinating with city and county shelter command centers. There were multiple shelters set up and run by the city and the county. Um, access to shelter evacuees is a first priority. You have to consider outreach timing also and avoid the masses of people that will self-resolve. So there's people with resources that ended up in the GRB uh, shelter because they had no way of getting to their friends or their families' homes because streets were flooded. Those folks overnight resolved, right, when the water cleared. And so we were left with the most vulnerable people after the initial wave of people um, at the shelter. Displaced populations are vulnerable to traffickers and you have to be aware that they may recruit in the shelters. Coordinating with the shelter command sisters, the centers and allowing for access to evacuees was probably the most difficult thing. If I didn't have my mayor's office badge, they wouldn't have let us into the dorms. Um, lots of community confusion around access and volunteer requirements and what was needed. We had to sort through all of that because we weren't part of the regular processor system. And over time, the dorm access was restricted. And so we were still able to go in, but it took a lot of explaining. Next slide. So assess the shelters for mass communication opportunities and promptly distribute information to evacuees. Each shelter operates differently, even for one disaster. So you wanna make sure you're pinpointing those mass communication opportunities and you're distributing materials at all of those congregation points. So that could be where the FEMA desk is, where service providers tables are, check-in areas. That's one thing we deeply regretted during the check-in, we could have actually gotten trafficking questions into the check-in form. But again, we started late because we didn't anticipate this was gonna happen. Um, cafeteria, dorm, or hall monitors also good spots for the communication. You may have restrictions, only one PowerPoint slide, only this many letters or verbiage. We were up against that. Um, and that's why we had these sort of cryptic messaging things that we did. We tried to um, get everything in. Engage volunteers and secure access to evacuees for cot to cot outreach. We think that that was vital to mitigating trafficking. And then of course, getting survivor input on the materials, which if you use ours, they're in there, that's incorporated in that. You may need to recruit volunteers if you're engaging several thousands evacuees, several thousand evacuees with outreach and you have to confirm the, the volunteer registration requirements beforehand to ensure their access. You have to tell volunteers where to park, the restroom, the cafeteria locations, and agree to a central meetup point. It's often very chaotic, even in the lobbies of the shelters. And so all of these things may be sort of simple when you talk about it in a regular context, but in a Harvey context, you really have to uh, coordinate. Um, you have to inform them of shelter rules, the need for official ideas, the rules for firearms and weapons. We had one volunteer show up, we were ready to go. He had a knife on him. He had to walk 20 minutes back to the garage we have to wait 20 more minutes for him to get back, things like that. Next slide. So also engaging volunteers and again, securing the access, we conducted a brief orientation to familiarize them with the shelter landscape, literally in the lobby. And we worked with the nonprofit volunteer teams because we didn't engage volunteers at the time. Bilingual or multilingual volunteers is a must. We instructed them to place cot notes in the unoccupied cots and to use discretion when children were present. We had them anticipate the needs of people that they would be talking to the best they could from making sure they had access to non-disaster shelters. We had partnerships with some that were operational. Um, making sure they were connected to Red Cross and FEMA if they needed other kinds of help. Uh, the mayor's office also had those pre-existing shelter relationships that I mentioned. Um, we did actually move trafficking victims that we found during cot to cot outreach into those. Now, multiple numbers should be listed on any of the materials just in case an organization, HPD, our police department, um, is impacted. Of course, during Harvey, 
it was all hands on deck and all of our police was assigned to water rescues. No one was taking the trafficking tips. So it's more, even more important to make sure that that's highlighted. We did work with the Coalition on Homeless who played a big part in the shelter here. We wish we'd previously trained them on trafficking because we were having these conversations as we went um, and have social workers on call to do phone intakes. We used that a few times during this um, outreach. Next slide. Educating the corporate community. I think cities should take the lead on educating the corporate citizens on labor trafficking and promoting those ethical um, practices to make sure that they're mitigating against the not only the trafficking risk, but any liability to the corporation and then your reputation as a city. We supported the oversight of contractors. As you know, I talked a little bit about it during the EO. And then we encouraged due diligence on laws over working living conditions to ensure fair worker treatment. You really wanna bring a risk mitigation lens to it for the corporate community. Next slide. Engaging consular offices, I didn't talk about this too much, but they offer a direct line to non-citizens and can be critical in helping to combat trafficking. Our regional department state, Department of State office actually put out a worldwide bulletin about workers and coming to Houston for rebuilding efforts. And they also proactively checked out all of our city contractors. They came up above board and they were proactively checking visa applications for compliance. And they'd actually set up watchwords to make sure that if anyone applied for visas around Rebuild or Harvey, they set up certain flags that they could ensure people were coming and then leaving when they said the Department of State, I'm sorry, the Department of Labor also provided statistics on where we have most of our laborers come from. And we helped use that. We use that information to figure out what languages we were going to translate into. Um, next slide. So this is my last slide, I believe, and that's a link to our emergency disaster response toolkit on our website. Um, once you get there, you can literally visit the rest of our website. Also look at all of the different um, toolkits that we have available and you can download anything that we say or develop. We want to share it. Uh, we want to share it for free. We want people to take our logos out of it or our city seal out of it and put in their own so they don't have to go through all the work that we went through to develop it. So please feel free to alter it. I know that's typically in violation of all kinds of copyright laws. We don't care. We are giving you verbal and written permission on our website to make sure you use it if you need it. Um, it has our PowerPoint shelter slide. It has our shelter newsletter excerpt. It has our cot notes, the nice ones and the redesigned ones. It has all of our social media planning uh, materials and the collateral files. It has signs that we had on our billboards as well as taxis. It has all of those case studies and it also has fact sheets for the corporate risk mitigation presentations. Right now it's if you wanted us to come out and give it. Um, and I think that's all I have. Next slide. It should be my contact information. Oh, I do want to add this. I do have this one last slide. You know, because we weren't a part of the disaster response activation. We actually had to activate ourselves, right? We saw that there was a problem. We saw that we weren't a part of the system. I wasn't a tier one um, employee, but we knew we had to do something. So we literally activated ourselves. I created space for myself in the command center. I asked our former chief of staff who was heading up the command center for a couple of minutes on their briefing so I could explain the nexus to all of the federal, state and local employees that were in the command center. Um, and then there was a lot of resistance and things because we were gonna be moving in and throughout the dorms. We had to work through all of that. And this was literally the first time I did something massive or big without notifying my mayor first. Um, but this whole concept of self-activating is the last thing I wanted to mention. Next slide. There we go. That's my contact information. Should anybody have questions that come up after this, you can feel free to reach out uh, to my office via email or my phone numbers. Thank you so much. And I'll hand it over to Robin to help us with the Q&A. Thank you so much. That was a lot of great information. And I can tell that you speak from such um, strong on the ground experience. And um, we do have a question. I, I have a couple more and I'd encourage everybody right now, um, I'm gonna take this down so so we can we can see each other. 
Um, and, and also encourage you all to please feel free to ask some questions um, because that was a ton of great info. So the first question, and this goes back to what you were talking about, um, really with the cot notices even, but how do you determine, um, Amy's asking, how can a person determine a legit company that is soliciting for work from a non-legitimate company? Yeah, so this is very tricky. You have to be very careful. Uh, what we were encouraging people to do is memorize the tip hotline number in case they got caught up with an illegitimate company. But the Department of Labor actually has a list of blackballed uh, contractors that they used to keep posted up in a very obscure space on this very massive federal website. But there are resources like that available. There's also the Centro de Migrantes in Mexico. They do a great deal of work with migrant workers and they may have more information as well on that. I'm wondering too, if local departments of, you know, business or departments of labor, or whatever, um, have what I guess would be called sort of bad actors or people who've been um, sanctioned in the past in some way. I mean, there might be something at your state level um, that you could check now and find out where that information is. I mean, one of the things that I'm taking from your presentation is don't wait until there's um, you know a, a hurricane warning coming. You know, do this preparation now and make make whatever it is. Like you said, your colleague who was um, out in Oregon battling you know potential forest fires or wherever that state was. Um, disasters can come in any number of ways, which um, force evacuations and the like. So um, this is something to really integrate into your work right now. Um, don't wait, right? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. We were just caught a bit unaware at, at the scale of Harvey. Um, and I had a colleague that called me and said, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? And she sent me the IOM guide. And remember, we're citizens. We were struggling with mm -hmm. water hitting us too, you know, mm -hmm. um, and your teams are going to be impacted. So many of my team members and volunteers through our nonprofit partners were personally impacted by Harvey, water damage to their cars, if not their homes, right? So you have to sort through all of that. And that's why it's better to do it beforehand. Yeah, and be prepared. Um, I, I wrote a couple of questions down. And again, we don't have any more in at the moment, but I do have some a couple of things to talk to you about that sort of piqued my interest first. Um, and, and we can do that, but going on your website, I just wanna encourage people again to go and look at all those great tools to, look at you know what you had um, available on social media um things that you can replicate and i want to ask you because you've done such great outreach and you do have these available um have you seen other cities around the country or the world take this on and, and maybe maybe a, a smaller scale you know i'm thinking about tallahassee and leon county we're we're like the biggest city and we're pretty small we're nowhere the size of houston but have you seen any um, other yeah. cities take this on? And, and what's that look, what, what does that look like? Can you talk about that? Sure. So one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about, um, but I did mention quickly in my strategic plan overview is our 1010 Human Trafficking Municipal Response Fellowship. So since Mayor Turner is the mayor of the fourth largest city in America, he is a celebrity at the United States Conference of Mayors, which is a group of 300 mayors that has a population in their cities of 30,000 or more. They meet twice a year in January and June. One of the meetings is always in Washington, DC. The other one at any one of our amazing US cities. So what we did well before Harvey, this is not associated with Harvey. In year three, we had essentially executed on all of phase one of our plans two years before schedule. And so we knew we had all the data, we had a persuasive, compelling story to tell about why municipalities should engage. So I went to Mayor Turner and asked if we could engage the USCM over the course of a year and a half, which meant three of their meetings. And we, he and I spoke on multiple panels. And then our third engagement was talking to the executive leadership, which is 30 mayors and their 30 police chiefs. We really advance a regulatory policy approach not a law enforcement approach to trafficking, but that was the audience. And we pitched to them on many of our initiatives, 
the metrics that we saw. And as you know, cities share common problems. The mayors were so excited. I'm sure they were getting constituent letters. And what we did is end it with a pack of our material, packet of our materials, but also an all expenses paid visit to Houston for their senior officials or for mayors to come so we can immerse them over two days into our approach to push out this replication. So 18 US mayor cities from small to large, Apex, North Carolina, very small city. My brother actually lives right outside of there, but their mayor came all the way to New York, Chicago, LA. They all sent people. Again, it was 18 cities. There was Bridgeport, Connecticut with some of the smaller ones, Augusta, Georgia, some of the smaller ones, of course, Austin and Dallas were there. So we did this and we were tracking 67 replication initiatives. So different aspects of our model that were being replicated all across the United States. Because our domestic 1010 was so popular, we actually worked with Bloomberg Associates that engages cities around the world to populate an international version of our 1010, which we modified for then the Syrian refugee crisis. And it was still all expenses paid. First class tickets from international locations cost a lot more. So we only had five countries that were represented or five government officials from four countries that were represented. And we actually, I can just pull this one snippet out. Our executive order on procurement, it was replicated within three weeks of whenever we did a 1010 by six cities, including Milan. And then to push our model out further, the US Department of State also sends me on what they call missions. And so far I've been able and been, I've had the time to go to India, Canada, and Malaysia for them, where I'll do city tours and talk to them about our municipal model and encourage a whole government approach to trafficking. So the last thing I'll say about that is about two or three years into our position, we were making waves. There was all this opportunity. There was all this ability to convene people that hadn't been convened before. There was opportunity to convene funders that hadn't been convened before. So Humanity United and the Novo Foundation took note and they issued a grant to cities to have a senior advisor on trafficking to their mayors of those cities. 17 cities applied and then Atlanta, Minneapolis, Chicago were actually awarded the funds to have people and they still have these divisions established in their mayor's offices. So that's four and then Baltimore city was doing this as well on their own a couple of years after we started. So there's five official and then through our 1010 there's numerous people through their existing capacities that were getting some of the work we've done done when we've given them the templates, right? So they didn't have to take a year and a half to write our procurement executive order like it took us. They could have it replicated in three weeks for their city system. So it's been replicated um, all over. That's wonderful. And and again, all of this can be seen on your website. Um, one of the things too to emphasize for the people who are here, mm -hmm is we focus today on disasters. And as you can, you know, they they hit a lot of the touch points of what your office does, right? So you've got, you know, you know the procurement issues and you've got these things that that overlapped with the idea of, of what happens when there's a disaster, but there's everything else that is constantly 365 days of the year are still very important to have an official like you in, an office like you have doing this work. That's pretty unique. Even if even if cities are taking pieces of this, right? Um, yeah. have, you, have you seen any other um, places that have a position designated? And I know you have domestic violence as part of your, your mission as well. Um, but do you see that kind of organizational piece other places? Yes, that's in Atlanta, Chicago, Minneapolis, <laughs> and Baltimore. And that's that Humanity United Novo Foundation funding where they have designated mayor's office divisions with people leading the charge. Yeah, there so the woman in Minneapolis is Shunu Shrestha and in Chicago, it's Darcy Flynn. I think the Atlanta person changed a couple of times who don't have their names and I can't remember the Baltimore person right now, but there's there's at least five of us now. Oh, that is fantastic. Well, congratulations on, on all that wonderful work. Um, tell me, one of the things that I also wrote down here from your presentation is um, what about the, the supply chain monitoring? I mean, when, when you go out and about and you, you know, 
you you put this in there and somebody says, yes, I'm in full compliance, you know, Corporation X, or how do you make sure? Do you do any follow-up or monitoring it? Is that linked to other um, big firms or other big agencies that do that sort of monitoring of so, compliance? So we all we have purview over <laughs> is monitoring city compliance on all of our construction and rebuild sites. And so we have a way that we do that through our contract compliance specialists that do pop-up visits on any of our 250 plus construction sites going on at a given time. Um, so they do that, they ask questions, they report tips to the hotline and we built it into their questionnaire. We have no authority over the corporations to do this. All we have is influence. And so if you know that all you have is influence versus authority, all the things I mentioned from the corporate risk mitigation mm -hmm. presentations to having the mayor's office of that, to having the mayor speak, to having the mayor lead with his executive order by example was a lot to, I can share anecdotally to get a lot of the corporations here attentive. And then at the same time, there are things happening internationally in the litigation space that's making it something they have to pay attention to. Um, so again, with all the rebuilding that's happening and that happened after Harvey, we don't have a single labor dispute yet. Um, and in Katrina, three years after Hurricane Katrina is when those signal case workers started to complain and protest that they were being trafficked and they were. And they were, and there was a very big verdict after that case too, which I'm sure, you know, whether it's carrot or stick, right? Um, whatever it takes, you know, it's out there. Um, someone asked a question you'd mentioned before some of the blacklisted companies um, if there's more information on where to find them, um, is there is there a place you you know of? It was so obscure. It was on the Department of Labor or Department of State's website. You can try, but it's very obscure. I would even try calling. But yes, there was a place on their site. I would have to dig to try to find it again. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very, very good. Yeah. And you know, at the on the other hand, there are also lists out there of companies. Um, as I've seen it, that are certified of, that they use non-trafficked labor. So while you can also say, you know, this is this is a bad company that's coming forward, you can help promote people who are walking the, you know, walking the talk and really um, having that as part of their um, their corporate um, ethic. Um, right. Uh, somebody's asking if this will be available to listen after today. Yes, this um, program is being recorded. And as usual, we will post this to our website and I'll put that link up in just a second. Um, yes, it will be available on our um, Stack website under educational resources. If you wanna visit our website, that's where we have it. Um, a lot of comments, excellent well, webinar. Um, people are, are really happy with this information. Um, so thank you. Um, another question I have is, um, on the supply chain, um, I, I'm curious because a lot of times when you talk about supply chain, sometimes people just throw their hands up and say, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, you know, what have you seen work in terms of inspiring um, corporations and others to really do that? I mean, it's important. We have an event. Um, very often we make sure that all the food, everything, you know, that we we patronize coffee shops, um, chocolate shop, people who are using non-traffic, you know, selling products with non-traffic labor. Um, how do you encourage these huge corporations to pay attention to their supply chains? Um, from the corporate risk mitigation presentations, that's its own separate 40 um, slide deck that we've delivered many, many times. Um, and again, we bring to case the case studies and the litigation and how that really represents a risk for them. Now, as far as a shining example, when we hosted our mayor's office event around it and we were doing our research, Apple has hands down the best supplier, um, not only conduct code and all of that, but they have compliance teams. So corporations, not the smaller businesses maybe, they have to make the decision to invest in them. And they've actually audited all the way down their supply chain without hiding behind the fact that we only have privity with the person that we contract with. So they actually go ahead and audit factories all across the boat to make sure 
um, that this isn't happening. Of course, that was prompted by negative press and litigation more than 20 years ago, but still they've done the right thing. So even if you just Google that for the bigger corporations, um, it's something that's on their site. Now, it's not something that they jump to speak on panels about in my experience, uh, but it's all there, all public. Okay, great. And somebody posted something called the um, OSAC Work Products Tracker. Um, there might that might be a link there, so um, so you can check that. I'm not sure if that's that. I don't know what that is, Joyce Williams, but but thank you. Um, somebody else um, posed a question about one of the biggest problems. This is someone who's with us from Moldova today is to work with um, unaccompanied um, children, people with disabilities, undocumented persons, especially women and war refugees. Um, Moldova is recognized as very vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and, you know, both in South in, in Southeastern Europe and transit and a destination country um, recommendations on working with this category. The person is asking of of people who have so many intersecting vulnerabilities. Well, you know, first of all, it has to be trauma informed if they're on the move and there's some kind of crisis that's causing irregular migration like the war force right now. Um, in the past, the Syrian refugee crisis, all of the cultural nuances need to be taken into place. There needs to be a network of nonprofits, service providers in tandem with government officials, border officials working on this together. So you have to build up this whole ecosystem to respond to the kinds of things we're seeing um, in the Ukraine and the surrounding nations right now. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm sure you are connected, but the Department of State's Office on Trafficking in Persons, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm hoping that's part of the, the NGOs that it, fund it funds and, and has point persons available at the Department of U.S. Department of State on this topic um, is also a good resource because, yes, it's there, as well as the United, United Nations Office on um, UND. UNODC? The ODC, yeah. Um, Prime. That's another place that might provide some, some assistance there. Um, um, just had a clarification, Robin. The yeah. OTIP office that was referred to sits in DHHS at the federal government. So that's okay. the Department of Health and Human Services. And then uh, the Department of State does have a JTIP office, um, yeah. is what they call it. And so, yeah, I'm sure that they're doing things too. Also, Thomson Reuters and is doing a lot of work with the Ukraine right now, along with Valiant Ritchie, who is the special repertoire for the OSCE on trafficking. So there's work being done already. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you for that correction. Um, okay, is there anything else you would like to highlight? It looks, I don't know if you've seen the chat, but we have people from all over, I realize now, all over the world, as well as all over the country from Indiana. And of course, we've got lots of our um, fellow Floridians here as well. Um, child welfare experts, people who are working with law enforcement, all these folks. I mean, I it just seems like everybody's got a role to play, not just in human trafficking, but in this subset of understanding what to do in the in the time of crisis. Um, any anything else you'd like to to share with this very diverse group of attendees? Sure. Um, I'd encourage everyone to go on our website. I'd encourage everyone to get in touch if there's something they think we can help with. The other thing I'd say, and I was about to mention it, but we moved on, was supply chain legislation is a hot topic. When I started, there were zero, then there were four countries, and now there's more than 12 countries that have this, including some U.S. states, right? So I think even though you may be in the services space, you want to get with your adv advocacy partners that may be advocating for changes in laws like that. And we have a philosophy. We know that you can put a law on the books and nothing can happen, but we try to get them on the books anyway, because we know in a hundred years, there will be different kinds of leaders in, in place and they'll already have things set up for them to at least do um, what may be right based on the law that was written. So that's one thing I'd share. The other note I'd share is that, you know, I, I know there's a lot of controversy over migrant workers. Um, especially in states like Arizona, Texas, and Florida. The thing I'd like to remind us all is, despite our views, no one should be mistreated, their human dignity. Um, no one should be exploited for that labor. I know there's a lot of mentality of like, well, they deserved it. No, no human being deserves to be mistreated. 
Um, my biggest issue is when I hear faith-based organizations and people that represent those places saying things like that. Um, my own faith and its text talks about people first and foremost and how our interactions with them are to be conducted with and through love. And so while I'm not gonna preach a sermon or anything like that, I do wanna encourage people to make sure that we understand that they're human beings first, no matter the politics across the border, which I understand. Second, if they're being mistreated and are trafficking victim, there are benefits available to them. And that there's a distinction between smuggling and trafficking, right? Someone who's being smuggled across the border is consenting to breaking a law, violating a political boundary, okay? And if that's all that happens, okay, and they get sent back, okay. But now if that person's trafficked during the course of their smuggling, that is a different case. The trafficking laws and the exploitation, the severe trauma that's been inflicted on them during that experience has to take precedence. Um, and so that's the thing I'd like to encourage at least the border states. And you know, internationally, this is a sentiment as well. So I, I thank you for that a lot. I, I think that there, there hasn't been a presentation I've done recently where someone has not brought up just what you've raised here. Um, and also there's a real misunderstanding that people who are, are trafficked from other countries all come through the border, um, not realizing how many arrive by plane. Our own agency got a call one time from a man in Fort Lauderdale. He had just landed at the airport, had been flown to Florida from another country. No one picked him up. And what it really ended up looking like as we worked with other NGOs on the ground was that someone was trafficking that group of men did not show up to pick them up at the airport and all those uh, they were they were left without any place to go they didn't know what was going on so people don't realize how people are flown into the airport how many essential workers were brought into the country to to do agricultural work during the pandemic here legally on visas um that these are people who um have been exploited and taken advantage obviously um by traffickers. So, so yeah, there's a real misnomer about the people have asked numerous times, haven't you seen your caseload just explode because of um, border crossings? And the answer is no, we have not. We have not. That is not how the people who are undocumented. And as you say, they're, they're only undocumented for the moment because we haven't had the opportunity to get them a TVC yet, or they haven't research, they haven't been able to access the resources to get the relief that they deserve. Um, so it's it's really a very kind of a, a an important point to raise, and I thank you for that very very much. Um, okay, um, you can see everybody that I've posted the link for where you can get a um, a copy of this program. I'm also going to post um, uh, Ms. Davis's PowerPoint. Um, there are a couple of other resources that that we have found that I'm going to um, from the federal government from um, HHS that came out recently on on disaster preparedness that I think will be useful for you all. So look for that in the next couple of days. Um, I will tell you all in terms and um, of our next um, program. Look for us in January. We're going to take the month off of December. But our next program will be on January the 20th, and we're going to talk about the trafficking um, of, of Native people. Um, uh, here, very often, we don't realize how many times the vulnerabilities are really um, so much greater, uh, particularly among Native um, women um, in, in Indian country and also um, in our um, state jurisdiction. So look forward to that. Um, and Mina, you know, let me thank you again for um, your time today and also for the amazing work you've done over the years and inspired so many. And I know you've inspired people today too. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for being here today.